At this point, oh, that was a nice little bit of fill, wasn't it? Uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Clayton Shaw from Sampad. Uh, Clayton is going to have the equivalent of herding cats as we um, have very lively, interesting, and interested speakers who only have three minutes to do their main bit of presentation. So uh, there's a timer and penalties. Yes, that's your chair. <laughs> Matt, squeeze up. And uh, can I all ask you to give a, uh, now what is becoming traditional, warm, a traditionally warm Hello Culture welcome to Clayton and the panel. Thank you. to introduce a panel shortly, uh, just do a quick introduction now. Um, it's an interesting theme around data uh, and uh, the subject matter that they had. I just wanted to introduce that a little bit more. So I've just got some notes here and uh, a number of questions. So assuming that data can be used as a tool for audience development, benchmarking, producing, business modelling and service delivery, the question is how? So one of the things I want to get out of today is, is actually what does this mean for cultural organisations? Because I don't have the answers for that either. Uh, there appears to be a trend in organisations and institutions, particularly those in the public sector, but not excluded in the private sector, in making data more available and more accessible. However, it can be difficult for cultural organisations to understand what data is out there and how it can be used, and also what data they have internally and how that can be used. Uh, so a number of questions that have risen are, if we're talking about the, a data revolution, should data be more fluid? Uh, more free-flowing and therefore easier to process uh, for better decision-making. Is there a greater role within government, I'm echoing now, uh, and local authorities to make data more fluid and improving the quality of data? Uh, do we need to invest in new tools and what might these be? And also, do we need to invest in people? And I think uh, uh, if we're talking about Nesta, there might be something that comes up there. Uh, can we use data to increase innovation in the cultural sector? Uh, as it sometimes is done in the private sector? Uh, and should cultural organisations identify what data they already have at their disposal first or identify the problem or the things that they want to uncover first? Um, according to the report, Digital Culture, How Arts and Cultural Organisations in England Use Technology, produced by Nesta and with a number of partners in 2013, uh, one of the things that came out of that was that almost three quarters of organisations now regard data as essential to their marketing and almost 60% view it as essential for preserving and archiving and for their operations. So there's a, there's a broader number of organisations that are engaging with digital. Uh, and we'll hear about that more from Nesta. So it seems that, uh, that, that many difficulties are faced by cultural organisations uh, and that data usage uh, can be called, uh, uh, the use of data can be, uh, or the lack of use of data is uh, through lack of awareness and training in possibly of how to use it for business purposes. So now I'll introduce the panel. Um, so we have Dave Hart, over, uh, just to my uh, right here, who's Senior Lecturer in Media and Communications uh, and Award Leader. I don't know what an Award Leader actually is. Maybe let's There's an award and I lead it. Okay. <laughs> 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 award Leader in Social Media at Birmingham City University, so not too far to come for you. Areas of interest include hyperlocal publishing and a role that the community news websites can play in fostering citizenship. Uh, we have Sarah Ellis, who is a digital producer for the Royal Shakespeare Company. She's an innovator, working on projects that incorporate data visualization, gaming, and web, and in numerous <laughs> works in numerous partnerships, including with Google. Uh, we have Dr. Henry Chapman. Uh, an archaeologist specialising in the use of data, uh, sorry, digital technologies for analysing, interpreting and presenting heritage. Uh, he's also the Senior Lecturer in Archaeology and Visualisation and Co-Director of the Digital uh, Humanities Hub at the University of Birmingham. His work includes the investigation of how digital and physical collections can enhance learning, innovation in relation to different disciplines and sectors. Uh, to my left, we have Matt Adams, who's a co-founder of Blast Theory, 
uh, renowned for its multidisciplinary approach using new technologies in theatre, games and visual arts. Uh, partners include Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham, uh, and they've won a Golden Nika Award. If you don't know the Golden Nika Award, it's a highly prestigious award uh, uh, offered out by the Pre Ars Electronica, uh, amongst other awards. And finally, uh, Tandy Williams, who is a research manager at the Digital R&D Fund for the Arts uh, at Nesta. Uh, she oversees a range of collaborative digital <coughs> R&D projects, including four big data projects, so it might be good to touch on some of those. Uh, she also manages the uh, MTM London Study on Digital Culture, which is what I referred to earlier, uh, which is tracking the digital revolution in the arts from 2013 to 2015. So I think just to add some context to the panel discussions now, it would be good to start with Tandy, just to get her presentation on uh, uh, what she wants to talk about today. Good morning, can you hear me? I might stand up here because I've got some slides and I'll leap right in. Um, my presentation, which is three minutes long, I'll do my best, is about um, data people. Um, I'm an analyst by background and temp it's tempting to talk about data and data analysis, um, but actually I think um, we've got bigger challenges than just analysis and I want to touch on some of those today. The study which um, has already been mentioned, we did last year and this is what we found. Lots of interesting stats, perhaps we could explore later with more time. But I want to just mention a couple of things. Less than half of the arts and cultural institutions that responded to the survey, and there were 900 of them in England, said um, that they used data to develop their online strategy. And only one in five used data to develop new products or services. So clearly there's some organisations who, who are doing great things, but I think there's a big opportunity there um, as I mentioned before, the temptation is to think about um, data analysis as one of the big gaps. But I actually think as a sector, we've got a gap in terms of non-data analysts, people um, who might not have analytical skills, but who need information, who can use data to make decisions, plan programs, create works. And I think um, as analysts and as people interested in data, we have um, an opportunity and a responsibility to help grow the interest in data, use forums like today to talk more about what it's about, what it means, what on earth we should do about it, and, um, and really try and grow a culture of people interested in data. Data people, if you will. Um, we've uh, funded around 50 projects so far. Um, uh, the native website was mentioned earlier, and I encourage you to have a, have a look at that if you haven't already. Um, there's a couple of big data projects um, and small data projects. Um, but it's not about how big your data is, it's um, what you do with it that counts. Um, I've, <laughs> I've stolen that from someone I heard last week, but I think it's really relevant. I think um, there's almost infinite choices about where we can capture data, what, um, how we can analyse it, getting bigger and bigger data and, and more data streams, but I actually think you can do huge amounts with the smallest piece of data and, and that's really what it's about. Um, these are some of the people who are involved in our projects. Is anyone in the room who's involved in an R&D project? Thanks Matt. <laughs> um, many of them are not analysts, in fact very few of them are. They come from all sorts of backgrounds, from the creative sector, from communications, from technology, from um, computer science. Um, and um, but they're all working um, with data in one way or another um, in their work and, and they're learning all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about their work if I can, but um, I've just done this very crude and simple diagram about how we might use data. I think a lot of the time I find myself in conversations about um, some of the earlier stages in this um, simplified data use um, process I've mapped out, but about capturing data and capturing the right data, so what um, data that's relevant to what we're really trying to achieve. We talk a lot about how to store data, how to share it, how to clean it, how to get um, better quality data, and we talk about analysing it and working out the patterns and what they show and how big it is and what size and shape of it. Um, we've um, got projects tackling all sorts of challenges in this um, ecosystem, but um, I think actually the most um, crucial parts are actually down here. It's about interpreting data and, and acting on it. And that's not a job analysts can do on their own. I think it's a job for all of us. I think um, 
this is where the meaning making happens and where the rubber hits the road in terms of getting value out of data as a sector. And I think it's something we can all get involved in. And um, I'd like to hopefully talk more today about um, the conversations we can have and how we can derive meaning from data and, and generate value. Um, oh, my little animation didn't work. Um, I could put heaps more words on this page, but I think interpreting data and acting on it requires a whole lot of different things and I'd be really interested in your ideas. I think it's about being open and curious to different disciplines and different ways of working. I think it's often about spending time together, collaborating with people you might not um, work with traditionally, being curious about what they have to offer, talking with them, spending time, questioning each other and challenging, what does this mean? Does it really mean that? What else could be happening here? and then working towards a shared understanding of what it's showing and, and what we can do about it. Um, I think that's all I've got time for. Okay, that's great. Thank Cheers. So, uh, I hope this is working again. Uh, so now we can move on to um, the next presenter. Um, who are we looking at now? I have my list. Uh, Matt Adams. <laughs> so organised. <laughs> right, let me see if I'm going to have slides. Plugging it in would help. There we go. Yeah, I think that'll be. I think that'll be. Is that you? That is me. Great. Uh, so um, today we, 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 we have already begun, and I'm sure we will talk a lot, as if data is something that surrounds art, uh, but is uh, separate from it. And um, I am here to suggest that data changes the way in which we think about the art that we make and changes the possibilities for the art that we make. Um, I'm part of a company called Blast Theory. We're a group of artists based in Brighton, who've been working together since 1991. Uh, there are a number of threads that run through our work, but the core of that is to think about what interaction and participation might mean for artistic uh, production uh, and distribution, uh, to think about how we might make artworks that invite people to, to interact with them in rich and complex ways. And today I'm going to talk about three projects that um, perhaps give an exam uh, some examples of the ways in which that's, that's been um, working. Uh, this project, Can You See Me Now, uh, was we first created in 2001 in collaboration with the University of Nottingham, the Mixed Reality Lab that Clayton mentioned. Uh, it's a game played online and on the streets uh, with um, members of the public playing online and, uh, and runners on the streets. And I'm going to just show, this is a, uh, a one minute video of this work um, when it was shown in Tokyo, just to give you a kind of flavor of it. Okay, so um, that's back from the day in, in the days when you used to connect to the internet through modems, uh, and um, what we uh, uh, you know so you've got a simple game connecting people playing online with people playing on the streets. What we realised at a certain point is that 
uh, our, our systems recorded all the movements of the people online and all the GPS data of the people performing on the streets. And we were actually able to recreate and play back an entire um, game of Can You See Me Now, second by second. Uh, and that, one, we could study that and understand how people played and what happened during games. But secondly, we could actually create an experience where we could put a game of Can You See Me Now online and then we could drop someone in later and they could wander around in this game as it unfolded around them. So they were just spectators in a virtual environment. And this um, uh, pr provides a, a kind of completely new way of us being able to think about um, the, the, the work that we created. Um, the second project I want to mention uh, is a, 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 a research project that we made in 2007 um, in a, as part of a project with the BBC and British Telecom. Uh, this game is called Prof Tanders Guess Aware. It's for, for Symbian phones. And uh, we were trying to create a campaign looking at uh, climate change and carbon footprints. And we made a game where uh, this character, Prof Tander, existed on your phone and he called you once or twice a day to ask you what you were up to. He might, for example, ask you how many light bulbs are on in the room that you're in right now, and you would just do a quick count and tell Prof Tander, and he would remember that information, and he might pop up 12 hours later or seven days later to ask you the same question, and he would gradually measure things about carbon footprints. Uh, he might measure how many, how many lights you have on in your home at 8 p.m. on a Monday night, two or three Mondays running. And this had the effect of, of gathering data, of enabling you to, uh, of bringing something to your awareness where suddenly you're, you're, you're conscious about something that previously you might never have paid attention to. And it's a bit like a pedometer, just the very act of sort of being asked about it or seeing the number begins to, to change your behavior. Uh, and the combination of this kind of playful character who uh, uh, was, was sardonic and stupid and asked you irrelevant questions in among these um, uh, more, more um, clearly um, utilitarian questions um, allow people to engage in a very particular way. And the third project to finish I want to mention is um, a piece of work that we're, we're doing now, which is uh, a piece of work called, uh, a project called Karen, a commission for National Theatre of Wales. And we, you can see directly the link back to the Prof Tanda project, which is this is an app that exists on your smartphone. We're working with Dr. Uh, Kelly Page and Professor um, Nina Reynolds from the University of Southampton to create a smartphone app in which you engage with, this, with a character, Karen, on your phone and uh, she, she, you have conversations with her uh, and as, as you do so, you are in fact um, uh, uh, answering questionnaires that come from psychological profiling uh, approaches so that the, 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 the app builds up a psychological profile of you, begins to understand you and adapts to you based on that basis. So it's looking back at the kind of corpus of data that's been established in, in psychology for psychological and behavioral profiling and using that to create a piece of work that adapts to you. I'm sorry, that's a kind of a gallop through it. But um, for me, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the outcome of all of, of this is to be able to think about different ways of storytelling where, where the story is adapting to you and is personalized for you. I'll stop there. Thanks. Swiftly uh, uh, moving on uh, to Dr. Henry Chapman. <coughs> There's me. Right, uh, so um, three minutes. Uh, just wanted to actually sort of look at this, the, the question when we started looking at this, does the tail wag the dog um, in terms of data? And the, I want to sort of start off actually by, by stealing somebody else's uh, comment. It's actually a colleague of mine's wife who used this phrase a lot in work. Uh, do we measure what we value or do we value what we're, what we're able to actually measure? Um, I think it's very relevant in terms of when we look at uh, digital data and data mining and all those sorts of things, is that if we are to use data that already exists, does that actually um, sort of dictate the kinds of questions we're able to ask of it? So, um, so th as a sort of starting point, you know, I don't want to be thinking about using what data's online and having that directing how we actually, you know, the sorts of answers and sort of information we can get. Now, when we start thinking about sort of cultural sector, the heritage sector, um, we do gather a lot of data about audiences. I'm thinking particularly about audiences, generally, you know, specifically. Um, and with those audiences, 
We can gather data on actually how people engage, what they like, what they don't like, um, but it's always a self-selecting group. Firstly, because it's those people who are, um, who are actually opting in to use uh, digital technologies, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Um, but also, we're actually only talking about the audiences that we might already have. So what I'm very interested in is actually how do we then reach or use the sort of technology um, and data to actually reach beyond those audiences which we already engage with. So in order to sort of start thinking about addressing that or thinking around that question, um, we have a current project uh, sort of running at the moment um, between the University of Birmingham, um, the Grain Photography Hub at the Library of Birmingham and also uh, the Swarm and, and Jason's just over there, Jason Pond, who's been working on this. And what we're looking at actually photography archives um, as a case study within this, this area. Um, what we wanted to do was to actually think, well, if you think about an institutional archive, you know, the traditional archive, the, the place you might visit um, as one type of archive, but there's also a lot of people actually produce content, produce photography um, uh, at, at different sorts of levels, but they, but they also consume. So there's sort of pr uh, producer, consumer, community, pr prosumer, as we've been calling them. Um, but they're not, they're not in the actual archive necessarily. And they might not actually be using the archive. They might use the Library of Birmingham as a building in this case, but they might not use the services there. So what we're thinking is actually how can you start connecting, making connections, and I particularly like Jane's idea of the, the sort of emotional connections between this prosumer community and the, the institutional archive. So unintentional archive, unintentional un archive. So in order to actually do something with that, and you can sort of see some of the, the diagrams that Jason's put together here, some of the actual analysis of data, um, using sort of data mining, crowd connecting technologies to actually um, identify firstly who is talking about photography, who's, who's actually putting their, their material up on, on, um, you know, on online boards and social media. And uh, with that, identifying which of those individuals are actually the influencers. Who, which, which of those people who are, who are not in the traditional archive, um, who, which of those people are actually having an impact, who has a lot of followers, and then targeting those people as a way of actually reaching new audiences, partially actually to, to start debates. The world's, you know, there's a lot of people, but if you can start narrowing that down to try and um, identify the people who you want to start discussing, understanding motivation, then we feel that actually using the social networking technology to actually identify influencers to then target them to understand how we can enrich new audiences um, within uh, to, to actually come, you know, understand why they might or might not actually engage with the institutional archive. So is the tail wagging the dog? Well, it might be at the moment, but I think the actual the technologies allow us to do these new things. And actually also, just a very final point, I'm probably on my three minutes, aren't I? Um, is, the, is actually when we look at this data, um, I'm a big believer in things like grounded theory, the, the idea of actually just analysing what you have and seeing what comes out of it as well. So I think there's, there's the, the targeted idea of looking at data, but also the sort of less targeted, seeing what data tells you. All right, thank you. So moving on, Sarah Ellis. Thank you. I haven't got any slides. Um, <coughs> I thought I'd just talk, if that's all right. So I'm just going to stand here behind something lovely. Um, so... I just want to ask some questions as well in the three minutes that we've got. We're all going to say three minutes, aren't we, in that we've got three minutes. Um, to say that culture's messy and culture's not always going to give you wanna, what you want to hear and culture's exciting and interesting. And actually, when we talk about data, are we really saying, do we want insight? And what is the question behind what you want that data to tell you is so intrinsic in this being a success and what we capture, what we explore, what we document, what we share and how culture can collaborate with academic thinking, can collaborate with technology, can collaborate. So it's about culture knowing its strengths, it's about culture knowing its weaknesses. And often we forget to ask the question until we evaluate it. And I think that's where we might need to shift the tail wagging the dog situation. And also to say that it's the feedback loops you create. Where does that data take you? Where do you want it to take you? Do you want to go anywhere with it? Or do you just want to sit there knowing what you know? And how do you share it? We have a responsibility when we look at data, the data that we have and the information we have. And as institutions, are people wanting, really saying they want knowledge and they want context and they want understanding and they want rigour? And that we need to think about data 
in lots of different ways. So it's not a homogenous exercise, is what I'm saying. So there's a couple of experiments that we've done at the RSC. They were quite small, but they were important. In 2012, we've, we created a data aggregator called Banquo that searched for references of Shakespeare and his plays through Twitter, Flickr and eBay to tell us social, visual and how Shakespeare was being traded. And it asked that question and every day you got a visualisation of data raining down on your screen to show you that the world was operating and doing something with Shakespeare already. We also responded to that with a mini commission called Alarum, where we put sensors all around the building to measure heat, movement, noise, to get the heartbeat of the building that's told you um, what times of day when it was busy, when it went quiet, when it shut down. And that was a riffing off what the world was doing online. We thought we'd show what our building. So we get us talking there. Matthew Somerville took our data from the World Shakespeare Festival and visualised that geographically and that was also an important insight into where our work was touring and where it was going and I think a small commission but really important was Tom Armitage did a data mapping experiment called Spirits Melting Into Air and we gave him our video footage of actors performing on stage and he meticulously um, went and uh, mapped the actors moves to show according to the text what how that changed your movement what that did and also to show the ephemeral nature of theater how it changes every night so that it, he he created wood carvings of each day that actor performed that piece and it was always slightly different so that's what i'm trying to talk about today is to say what are the big questions that we ourselves have to as practitioners take the responsibility with with data and how can it make our work better but also what are we looking for and what can we, how can we make our work collectively better? Thank you. Okay. Uh, there you go. You had a slide with your name on and uh, in mind. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Uh, I thought I'd talk uh, a little bit about um, listening to big data. Um, you know which film this is from? There you go. So um, I'm su suggesting there's an ethical dilemma here, aren't I? This is a German film where this character at the end of the uh, uh, East Germany era is listening to um, the lives of others. Uh, uh, however, I'm going to talk now a bit about listening to the lives of others online and how we do that and what we can, uh, what we can you know, get out of that and create value from it. So the, the questions I thought relevant here... Uh, to how we might think about data that becomes as a result of listening to people using social media and the data that generates. So uh, I'd have thought relevant <coughs> questions for, for you were, where's the big data that tells me what people say about their everyday cultural engagement? So how do they talk about cultural engagement? That's not with a hashtag, that's just in a general kind of sense. Where is that and how can you find that? Uh, how do you capture it and how do you make sense of it? Uh, and then how do you create value from it? Those, I thought, would be relevant questions um, for you. Um, uh, you have to realise, you know, that social media creates a, an immense amount of data. You know, uh, the internet is full of these kinds of scary infographics telling you that there's a million tweets a second or some such nonsense. Don't step away from the in infographic, OK? Don't photograph that like it's some kind of truth, OK? That's, that's just kind of... <laughs> Th those are probably made up, okay? Don't be looking at those kind of infographics. They're not good for you, okay? Better to think about the kind of data that's produced in your domain, in the domain that is either a place or a subject matter that you're inter interested in. So your audience is not the entire world. It's better instead to think about big data in small places. Maybe the big, small places in which your cultural organisation operates. So as an example, I've done some recent research around actually about community news websites, but that, this took me into South Birmingham and to try and scrape the data that's produced as part of the engagement that the B31 Voices hyperlocal news website does. So we scraped kind of uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and, you know, in this small place, it generates a decent amount of data. So, you know, in one month, this is data from, uh, there is uh, 2,399 comments. Uh, the website itself only generates 20 comments in one month. So this is nice. This is, this is pretty meaty. It's not a million comments. It's 2,399. 
Uh, I'll come back to this data in a moment, but I just wanted to make a distinction between uh, listening uh, and reflecting, if you like, a reactive and reflective way in which you uh, might use data. So uh, I think what you do already is you listen to the social web and the data it produces. You might do what I do, which is have custom searches in TweetDeck. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're from the Hippodrome, you might have a custom search for Hippodrome, drinks, prices, WTF, just to make sure <laughs> people are uh, 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 not too put off by the price of... It's more like you put LG Arena, drinks, prices, what the... But I have a, a search for stuff in Bourneville where I live that isn't talking about chocolate, is trying to talk about the place. Um, uh, but that's listening to... What you really should think about is how to pull all this down in one go. You know? So I think Twitter and uh, Facebook APIs are your friend. Okay? And you should spend a bit of time understanding how to use those and what they produce. In Facebook, it produces some scary stuff that looks like this. This is JSON data, but there's only two steps to get this to a nice place, i.e. A, a, an Excel spreadsheet, a place that most of you probably understand. Um, a pivot, you know, if you can do a pivot table in a spreadsheet, or do what I did, which is marry somebody who knows what, how to do pivot tables in spreadsheets, <laughs> then, you're, uh, then you're away, really, and you can start to make sense of data. It tells you interesting things. So in B31, it tells me that people want to talk about pets more than they want to talk about arts. Uh, but that's fine. Pets is a kind of, you know, social glue, if you like. Dead pets, live pets, lost pets, found pets, all kind of pets, really. Um, but it's valuable data. They do talk about arts. They talk about the Longbridge Arts Project, which is ongoing. I know people hear from that. Um, they have really strong opinions about the arts. But this is quite interesting. So you pull this into a spreadsheet and you see it at once, really. And this is people not saying hashtag Longbridge Arts or whatever. This is people talking about it in their casual, everyday way on social media. And that's useful. What's interesting about B31 is they take that and they turn it into something else, which is quite positive, I think. They think about the actions that can come out of that. So they try and be proactive and they have a hashtag around positive B31. Uh, and um, I, I seem to have circled a comment which probably sums up Northfield for those of us who know Northfield. At least it's not Chelmsley Wood. <laughs> okay, so really, uh, I think what I'm saying in that drilling down is that it's worth uh, uh, thinking about big data, not as scary, massive, and, and gigantic, but actually, I actually think it's worth thinking about big data as really small qualitative data in disguise. And that's what I think you want to get down to, and which might be more useful to you. Thank you very much. We will um, open the floor to, for questions from the audience, but just before that, I've just got a couple of questions to ask the panel. Um, uh, particularly, what I'm hearing from the panellists today is, uh, and also from what James talked about earlier on as well, actually, there seems to be a bit of a dichotomy between external, publicly-facing data, the data that's out there that you can use to your own benefit, and I'm thinking about the work that you're doing with Blast Theory. Uh, and also data that you have internally within your own organisations and how that might be used. Uh, do you have any comments on, 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 on those sort of issues? And I, I don't know, Tandy, whether you, particularly some of those big data projects that you've worked on, did they work on data that they have internally or was this external data that they were using to innovate their practices? Mm. Oh, oh, Clayton, there's um, examples of people looking at internal data and external data and I think and, and actually bringing those two sets together often. Um, I think the real question is, as Sarah mentioned, is what, what are you um, trying to do or what, what question are you interested in um, and how does that relate to your sort of core mission or what your ultimate objective is and then thinking about what data you need and, and whether you've got that internally already or, or you need to look externally. Um, I think there's a big opportunity to, sh to share data and a lot of the projects are looking at sharing data across different organisations and seeing what they find um, because often if you look just at your own data and internally <coughs> it's kind of not that interesting sometimes um, and you need to look, put it in context of the, the bigger picture or maybe other organisations who are doing that kind of work or connect it with um, real world sort of um, experience in order to understand what's happening and derive meaning from that. Okay. 
you want to add something in there? I think it's really important not to just look at our own data because I, I wonder whether it would be interesting to cross-pollinate tourism data alongside the company's data so we can get a much better insight into why, for example, from an RSC perspective, why do people come to Stratford? When do they come to Stratford? When do they book to come to Stratford? Can we then sync in our messaging, uh, the timing-wise? Can we cross-fertilise that information? So. I'm, I'm worried that we will just talk to ourselves just through looking at our own data sets, if that makes any sense, and we need to think more broadly. I would also say that closed data, our private data, our <coughs> owned data, is just we need to respect the public data. Just because it's public doesn't mean that you can just use it however you want. You've got to respect the data that people are putting in the public space as well, and that's what I'm saying is it's just because it's public. You ne what we need is a culture of openness between the public and private data sets, I think, and, and we need to, to make sure we get that right, otherwise people just won't put information out there, which is incredibly useful to us. Okay. Do you want to add anything to Yeah, I was, I was, I was just going to say, the, um, I mean, one, one of the things is, you know, I guess the obvious point is that as soon as um, an organisation gathers public data, they end up generating, you know, by analysis, they generate new data anyway, which becomes internal. Um, but also, I think the the importance of the sort of fluidity of data, because you know this it's the um, it's the idea of us not being curators of our own data in the same way or curating whatever data we might mine, um, because as soon as you do that, it starts creating the boundaries and the barriers and the ideas. The fluidity, I think, becomes really important, particularly when you start looking at trends and seeing change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dave, do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, no, only that. I think. Um, uh, I was trying to make the point that this isn't out of uh, your reach, really, and that um, uh, it is worth taking time to, to learn simple things about how to uh, make sense of uh, in my own interests, you know, in, in conversations on social media, and turn those into useful, uh, you know, reflective tools for you as an organisation. You know, I think I'm. Uh, I, uh, I'm not somebody who's all about the conversation, you know, and I'm not that interested in that kind of uh, uh, thing. I'm actually more interested in that kind of second bit, which is uh, scraping data, using it as an analytic tool, and then, you know, that's the kind of thing I know you get presented with at quarterly board meetings, you know. In general, what have people said about us this month? How do we react to that? Does that make us change anything, or do we, you know, if you're the Longridge Art Project, you, you meet that head-on, really, that, uh, that really challenging thing about... Uh, what are they going to put in that traffic island in the middle of Longbridge, you know, and why aren't people liking it? You know, let's face up to that and let's, uh, let's engage with those people. And I think, you know, you have to look around for where those conversations are. But my point is, you know, you should, uh, I don't outsource this stuff. You know, you should do it yourself. It's not that difficult. Or, or, or you know, I'll, I'll help you do it. No, I won't help you do it. I've got to, I haven't got the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Matt, do you want to add anything to this? I mean, do you use your own data internally for any particular purposes? Because it seems like you're using it a lot for innovation purposes. Yeah, no, and we also use it organisationally as well. I, I, I think it's about um, the starting point for us is about trying to ask accurate questions that data might be able to help us answer. So we don't really pay any attention to Twitter or Facebook or any of that sort of stuff. What we do is try and frame a question that we need to understand. And then you think about what sources of information are available to help us understand that and answer that. So for example, we did a commission for the space called a game called I'd Hide You. And we, we, we tried to make a game that was very quick and easy for people to share on Twitter and Facebook. And so then we're saying, the, the question we're trying to say is how are people coming to that project and how are they sharing it? It's a simple and precise question and then we're trying to then look at the ways in which we can build answers to that. What, what, what different sources will shed some sort of light on that? And then going to the next level of going, well then, how can we measure whether people did or did not have a good experience? And, and so, you know, my, my experience is that any weakness in our systems is always to do with whether we're asking the right question with enough care at the outset. Because if you get that correct, then everything flows much more logically from that. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience at this stage? Uh, we have two, but we're going to start it there because you're Lara.
Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Caroline Bevan. I'm an infographics designer and uh, data visualizations and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between data and the audience. So how do you, are audiences still scared of data? Do they want to know about it? Or is it something that really should be kept away from the audience? And think of the, the, you know, the people that come to your museums, <laughs> look at your projects. Do they want to know more about data or should there be that distance? I, I would just say that w we have to be really careful about the mythology of data and, and data as a, a, this enormous umbrella thing because it's a, it's a little bit like saying, you know, are people scared of air? You know, it's like the, 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 the data exists in every form all of the time. The, the question that I would turn around to say is, you know, that, that no one in their right mind cares about data per se. You know, data is a set of understanding. It, it's, 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 it, it's, a, it's a set of, uh, of, of, of points of information and then the, the, what you do with that data is to try and extract <coughs> understanding from it. And that in, that in general, audiences care not a whit about any of that stuff. You know, what they're coming to us in this room for is really meaningful, important cultural experiences. What's changing for us in the, in the, in the field of culture is that what, where they are is changing. Because as James, some of James' graphics showed us, people are spending much more time in places that are that we don't have not historically existed and so we have to try and work out how do we exist in those places so so uh, you know the, uh, the you know the simple answer is no i don't think audiences care a little bit you know they're looking for something interesting rich sophisticated moving does anybody else want to respond yeah. to that I'm just wondering about the Royal Shakespeare company and how that might... But <laughs> well, they don't care until you make money from it or you use it, and I think that's really important. It's, it's, you've, that's why I talk about the culture of openness, is what's your agency behind the data that you want and why you want to capture it, and are you being transparent with your audiences if you are asking them for information, what that's going towards. But it, the profound... I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of our audiences want a profound connection with us. And they want it more, and we, we are learning that they are, the meeting points for culture are changing. It's not just a building, it's devices, it's, it's online. And, and we've got to learn. So if we can use data to be more insightful and make better experiences, <coughs> then I think it's a trade. I think that but there is a moral construct behind that, that we must never, we must, we must keep in the debate as well. Just taking things a little bit deeper on that one, though, about the question that's come from Caroline. You, you mentioned the uh, projects where you looked at the, the kind of heartbeat and the, the personality almost of the building, what it was doing at the time. What was the questioning that went behind that? What was, what was it that you wanted to get from it and what kind of change did you want to effect from that process? I don't think we wanted to change anything. I just think we wanted to personify the building and to give it a heartbeat and um, we put sensors to do that. And because we'd looked at the heart, online heartbeat through, through what people were doing, we wanted something to artistically respond to it. Um, what I should say is that not everyone was comfortable with putting sensors in the building, people that worked there, and we needed to, 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 to work that through because the unknowns are always difficult. So a lot of what we're doing is, it, you know, a lot of it is about explaining what, that, what that's doing, so. Um, I'm aware that we've got some questions coming, but we've got Laura first, and then we to make a So go, shoot. <coughs> Um, I've changed my mind what I was going to ask, actually. Obviously. Um, because I just want to follow on from that, that point, actually. Um, from the point of view of, you know, producing really <coughs> vibrant, culturally exciting and innovative work, and I'm kind of looking at everyone, not just a blast theory and the RSC, um, how do you pursue that artistically and culturally and creatively, but at the same time actually operating quite ethically in terms of how you manage that data, especially in a period of cultural resilience, exploiting income streams and all those other things that <coughs> arts organisations have to do. What is, how are you going to start approaching that balance? So I think a lot of arts organisations are probably struggling with the, with the two. I didn't say it was an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can talk about, I can talk about that. Sorry, yeah, to dive in again. But um, I think it's great that you mentioned the word ethics because I think that that's a much, it's a much, it's a much more useful term than uh, than rights and permissions, uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, because uh, actually, um, as cultural organisations, we are we we we, we exist through um, a, 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 a form of trust 
that our audiences place in us. Uh, and that, that stems from artists and, and uh, a belief that artists have the ability and the, uh, and the right to reflect things back to the culture that others don't. And that is only possible through, through a very strong sense of, um, of an ethical basis on which that happens. And so then I think that extends outwards in terms of, our, uh, in terms of how we handle data and how we interact with audiences, which, which is about <coughs> um, thinking, uh, thinking ethically about what is the correct way to do that, rather than getting hung up on rights and permissions. They are not separate, but you're much better to start from that position about what would an audience expect, what, is, what might be reasonable. We are into an area that is, uh, that is, um, that is contested. You know, that Rights Museum project is a classic example where, to some people, that's encouraging you know, copyright violation. You know, because in their mindsets, they've got this idea that anything created must be copyrighted and anyone messing with that is a violation of copyright, which is a kind of complete misnomer. You know, it's a complete sort of false equation that some people get very hung up on and, and, and forget that the culture is actually about kind of recycling and appropriation and that you know that we that, that, that cultural organizations should be we should be leading in terms of society in terms of trying to offer new models multiple different ways of doing that some of us will go at one end of the spectrum and some will go at, at the others and that depends a little bit whether you're the RSC or blast theory you know we have a different license a different set of relationships with a different set of audiences and we will operate in different ways and that's as it should be you yeah. heard about a project yesterday, and I don't know the name of it, but it was announced at Horizon Conference. And it um, is about the ethics in the cultural sector of using, around using data. And one of the things they pointed out was that the, some of the challenges or constraints that um, ethics and regulation also um, throw, throw up can actually be a fuel for creativity. And that with um, constraint, you, you're forced to take a more creative approach to what you're doing and think outside the box. And, maybe think of a different way of approaching things and, and really being open with who you're talking to and, and how they want to um, give information and share information and benefit from that. So I think there's lots of interesting projects um, which are tackling this and one of them is at Norwest Media Centre in Bristol where they um, have developed a data toolkit working with young people and their local community um, to help um, open that conversation about data and um, they've built a cardboard living room and invented this whole game for collecting data and using it and it's um, really fascinating work um, and there's lots of other projects like that um, where they're getting creative about ethics. Um, I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth from Arts Council England, am I on? Yeah, brilliant. Um, I think in 2010 when I joined the Arts Council we saw digital really as an economic pot noodle that as soon as we put some data in we were going to make loads of money and I think what we're alluding to here building on what Sarah and um, Jane have spoken about is a new digital experience. I've got a daughter who's 11, she gets super llamas when she does a really good anime commission and she's really pleased when she gets a caped super llama. So can we see the cultural sector using digital more as a material? So again, not around the economic framework, but moving into a different space. You might want to respond to this one. Well, just in terms of volume of, you know, on social media, there's, I think there's been various attempts to you know, bring that to life. And uh, even I'm thinking of the 4IP project with uh, RSC a few years ago, uh, you know, uh, using social media as a way to put characters out there. Was it Romeo and Juliet? I think it was. Yeah. The yeah yeah, yeah so, but I mean, I, 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 um, so that's playing with the technology and, you know, the, the data that comes out of that. Actually, I don't think which was made of the data that came out of that, actually, but it generates followers, it generates updates, it cascades outwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm a bit more interested in what's the, what's the uh, critical response to the big data agenda in the arts, you know, um, is, is the, uh, what's the Stan's Cafe uh, thing with the rice? Uh, I should yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that strikes me as a critical response, doesn't it, to, to big data issues, really. And um, I think that, uh, I suppose, that, or the pitch around Hello Culture strikes me as more as a, um, uh, how's data going to help us survive? You know, I'm not sure the pitch is that much different from uh, the way digital was pitched four years ago. But actually, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's the... Where, where's the critique to the privacy issues? Where's the critique to the ways in which 
data is uh, scooped up. And of course, they're more blithely talking about Facebook and talking about positive things B31 do. But actually what they're doing is presenting uh, and bringing in people into Facebook's domain. And what do Facebook do with them? They offer them up to advertisers. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no economic benefit for anybody there except for Facebook, you know. So, I'm, you know, where's the critique of that really would be my question about, you know, for, the, for culture at this moment. And, and on that as well, Henry, with the work that you're doing at the University of Birmingham, of course, that is what it's about, isn't it? It's about offering uh, a culture, uh, not as an economic imperative, but yeah. as, a, as an access tool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the idea of actually being able to, to reach, I mean, sort of the almost materiality of, of digital, you know, something which, um, sort of the reward point, points being prizes, of course, but, the, um, but I, 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 I think that's just a really interesting space, actually, within... Um, within digital, um, although now we're not using the word, but the, um, uh, but the, the yeah that, that that sense of rewarding so much more is um, I'm always reminded back to um, sort of the Walter Benjamin 1930s kind of way of looking at sort of the authenticity debate starting off, um, and it's not real, therefore it has less value, but does it? And I think that really in the last decades, the actual value of the digital and the value of the experience through the digital um, and the multiple ways you can do that actually is becoming the reward in itself. So I, I love the idea you know, the, the, from, from an 11-year-old in, in terms of that, that system. And I think, I think it is happening, and I suspect this is also going to be something which is much more palatable to um, a different generation. OK, I don't think we've got time for any more questions because we're going to be eating into coffee break time. So uh, I think we'll just wrap it up there. Uh, can I just ask for a round of applause for our panellists? Thank you.